This is Casey, and I'm going to start off um, sharing a bit about the organization New Dream, to give some background before passing over to Kelly to get into her research. And then I'll, I'll flip back over to get into a little more depth on some of the tools and resources that New Dream has created uh, that we hope could be helpful to you um, in sharing with your networks. So I'd first just like to start by thanking Nebraska Recycling Council and, and Heather and Julie in particular for inviting us to share this research and our resources with you today. About 20 years ago, a group of activists came together, uh, sought to draw attention to the links between individual action, social justice, and the broader environmental impacts. Um, between, the excess, between excess materialism and the negative impacts of that on, on human well-being, especially children's development. And so then out of that effort, New Dream was created to spur awareness and to create resources to help individuals, institutions, and communities question the far-reaching impacts of consumption and counter the commercialization of our culture. So since its founding in 1997, New Dream has worked to, as the mission states, you know, empower individuals, communities, organizations to transform the ways we consume to improve well-being for people and the planet. And our overall goal has been to help change behavior, attitudes, and social norms to reduce consumption, to build community, and improve quality of life and to support the movement of individuals and communities that are pursuing this lifestyle change, um, community action, and solutions to our social, economic, and environmental problems. Uh, you can go forward, Heather. One slide. Thanks. So the next slide shows um, mentions our Simplify the Holidays program. It's one of New Dream's most popular campaigns, and it's the one that I'm gonna focus, we're gonna focus on today. Uh, Kelly's research was fit into this, this part of our, work, our, our programming. Uh, the, the program, the campaign, provides inspiration and practical tools to help individuals and families try to enjoy what matters most and to prioritize meaning and fun over consumption and stuff during the holidays. The, the resources are intended to help, help us turn our vision for what, is a more, what are more meaningful holidays with less stuff into a reality. And in doing that, move forward the societal shift from focusing on consumption to a focus on caring and connecting uh, to ourselves, to each other, to the planet, uh, and hopefully not just during the holidays, but every day. So the next slide shows that um, sort of why simplify. New Dream envisions a world in which the values that enhance well-being are the primary drivers of societal behavior, uh, resulting in reduced consumption and healthier planet. Uh, studies suggest that beyond a certain per capita income, happiness and well-being is a function of non-material factors. Values, values that are most linked to well-being are those that direct us to have experiences that help us feel safe and secure, uh, competent and worthy, authentic and free, and connected to others. According to psychologist Tim Kasser, the author of The High Price of Materialism, these intrinsic values are grounded in people's real psychological needs, and they focus on building strong relationships, an active and engaged community, service to others, access to nature, personal growth, and self-acceptance. Surveys show also that people who focus more directly on their family and friends and spirituality during the holidays report having happier and more satisfying, a more satisfying season. So, yep, let me highlight a few of the latest facts about holiday shopping and spending. In 2018, this year, holiday retail sales are expected to total around 720 billion. So that's a four and a half percent rise over last year and a 3.9% 3 3 average rise over the previous five years. This year also, according to the National Retail Feder Federation forecast, 
Nine out of 10 Americans report that they will spend as much or more this holiday season as last season, with the average expected spending of $658. A uh, survey in 2013 revealed that about half of consumers, almost half, admitted that they're likely to overspend their holiday budget. Uh, next slide shows that meanwhile, we at the US is running out of landfill space. According to a new report by the Solid Waste Environmental Excellence Protocol, SWEEP, it looks like the 2,000 active landfills in the US that hold the bulk of this trash are reaching their capacity and that the U.S. is on pace to run out of room in landfills within 18 years. Next slide shows a little bit more encouraging news that according to national polls New Dream conducted in 2005 and 2014, more than three in four Americans wish the holidays were less materialistic. Nearly nine in 10 Americans believe that holidays should be more about family and caring for others, not giving and receiving gifts and an overwhelming majority of Americans feel that we need to make major changes in the way we live to counterbalance the environmental destruction resulting from our high consumption lifestyle. So now Kelly will share about her research on encouraging, on gift giving for waste reduction strategies. <laughs> thank you, Casey. And thank you. I also wanna thank the Nebraska Recycling Coalition for inviting us and the city of Raleigh who helped fund my research in North Carolina and anybody that maybe participated in my research, you um, may be on the call. So anyway, thank you to everyone. Uh, so first I just wanted to briefly set the stage for my talk. Um, this is kind of how I see the current state of affairs, right? So we have poor recycling markets. We have restrictive markets due to uh, China's national stores. It's making it difficult to recycle less than perfect material. We have, um, you know, even with well-run, convenient curbside recycling programs, you can come and, and encounter stagnant recycling rates or capture rates. And then the interesting thing about recycling is that there is this feedback loop. And so what happens is we consume something, we recycle or we compost the product, and that makes us feel good about ourselves, so we consume more. So it is a, an interesting cycle that pushes us to consume more. And finally, you know, this does tie to climate change, whether waste disposal and the subsequent generation of methane, you know, create um, uh, climate change that impacts our health or waste disposal that may create leachate and could be harmful to our environment and health if not properly handled, or maybe the improper waste disposal, uh, breeding mosquitoes that transmit deadly diseases for you know, around illegal dumps and things like that. So there is this clear tie in my mind to climate change and its effect on health. The next slide. But I wanna kind of share with you some ideas to move us beyond the status, um, the current status. And I'm kind of going point for point by what I just discussed. So what if we take this opportunity in restrictive markets to change the narrative from recycling is getting more difficult or expensive to the idea of decreasing consumption and decreasing the ultimate need to recycle or compost. The next one, you know, if a community has a well-run curbside recycling program um, and participation rates begin to stagnate or decline, you know, how do we really know that that's bad, right? So if waste disposal also doesn't increase, can we assume that waste prevention is occurring? And I do not have the answer to this, but I know having been in the recycling community for a long time, metrics are difficult when it comes to waste prevention. So I wanna put it on the table and say that I'm willing and interested to work with others to kind of talk about this idea of metrics as it relates to waste prevention. Um, the next one here, you know, is the one thing that my public health degree taught me was that prevention is key. So in health, we wanna prevent people from getting sick in the first place. And this whole idea is to move upstream. So, you know, we can take that for waste and we can talk about preventing it in the first place. So I, I you know, implore and call upon my colleagues in, in recycling um, to start talking about waste prevention and, and moving forward with this idea of moving upstream and tackling that individual feedback loop that gets us to consume more. I'm not gonna show it to you, but there's a great video. You're seeing the link here on the screen 
the public health community uses this a lot about prevention. So it might just be a way for you to um, frame this differently in your mind or with your constituents as you move forward if you want to take the time to watch it later. It's just a two-minute video. And then my final point on this slide is, you know, really the environmental community has been talking about polar bears and melting ice caps in relationship to climate change for years. And this does not always resonate with everyone. So I would argue that a public health frame could maybe move others to take environmental actions when they see out how it personally affects their own health and well-being. All right, next slide. Um, so as you heard, I started working on this public health degree about four years ago, and my interest lies at this intersection, one of which could be illegal dumping, as I already mentioned, right? But the list goes on. However, for my thesis, I took a different route. I focused on environmental degradation and its relationship to mental health, and that's when I was introduced to New Dream and volunteered to do my thesis there. Next slide. So if you do a quick search on Amazon, you're gonna find over two dozen books about the zero waste lifestyle. And that doesn't even include people that uh, follow the voluntary simplicity or minimalistic movement. So the general public has really taken this term and they're running with it. And I know there's uh, different, scenario, uh, different schools of thought, I guess, among the recycling community as to this term, whether they like it or not. But I would just caution you to say that you know, the general public is using this whether, whether we like it or not. Next slide. So how do we get individuals to decrease their consumption? And there are a lot of behavior change schools of thought. One theoretical model that I like that I'm showing on the screen here is the social ecological model. And the reason I'm showing that is because it, it shows you how we can move upstream. So this is a holistic way of looking at an issue and provides a lot of insight into how you get to long-term behavior change. You need to not only address the individual, but the family, organizations, community, and public policy. So I'm going to come back and talk about this at the end um, and give it a little bit more context. But for you, the, you know, my thesis focused on this individual behavior change. But there are definitely things we can do in around, be doing around waste prevention in all of these spheres. Next slide. So as Heather said, the goal was to um, decrease the amount of material gifts given and shift that to an experiential gift, increasing your happiness and spending time with friends and family and in the out of doors that ho hopefully also um, increases your happiness but supports the environment by decreasing consumption. Next slide. So the five behavior change project steps that I'm following come from a book called Fostering Sustainable Behavior by Doug McKenzie Moore. And I'm gonna talk about each of these steps as we go through my presentation, so I won't talk about them here on this slide. Next slide. So the first step is to really select a very specific behavior that you wanna focus on. So for me, it was giving an experiential gift. So this could be going someplace with friends or family, it could be getting out in nature, um, or it could be doing a class. And when you do a class, it could be something that you teach a friend or family member that you have a skill of your own, or maybe it's going to a rec center or something like that and taking a class with others. All right, so step two is to do this barrier and benefit research. So. This is where I'm going to spend a good deal of time talking now. But the barrier and benefit survey that I did included 189 participants from North Carolina, again, funded by the city of Raleigh. You'll see here we had a good um, variation in respondent demographics because we were able to kind of buy this survey panel. So in addition to running the statistics on just some demographic questions, I created a couple of indexes um, due to a series of questions that I asked within the survey. So I also created some segments around those that did outdoor activities, those that I quote unquote called green minded, and those that uh, responded differently based on their current happiness level. Next slide. So we asked them, you know, what types of waste reduction activities were people already doing? So I'll pause here on this slide. You can see that they say often or almost always, they're carrying that refillable water bottle or coffee mug and, you know, 
definitely the reusable bag is up there. But I just want to draw your attention to the bottom of the list. You know, sometimes people are borrowing or leasing goods, or sometimes people are wearing clothing from thrift stores. So I think there's an opportunity here for my recycling colleagues to say, hey, you know, what is it that we're promoting all the time that, you know, people are already doing? And what is it that they're only kind of remembering sometimes to do that we could focus on more often? Next slide. So then I asked them, you know, how do you spend time with friends and family? So um, this was the top three things that they did at least once a year with friends or family was to eat out, take a trip, or go to the movies. And you'll see here the bottom three things that they do are dancing, a spa day, or attending that class that we talked about was one of those experiential gifts we wanted people to do. The thing about this that, um, oh, if you can go back for me, uh, the thing about this question in particular was we also wanted to see where people fell in those out of door activities. And so thankfully they were not at the bottom, but you know, they also were not at the top. And, and as Casey said, really spending time outside can increase our happiness and well-being. So that was another thing we were hoping to get more people to do. All right, next slide. On this slide, I won't go over this in detail, but you know, the main thing we were asking were the um, barriers and benefits associated to giving an experiential gift. And, and really the top benefit to giving an experiential gift to friends was that it was unique. But the interesting thing was, is that people see experiential gifts as having a different benefit for family. For family, it provides lasting memories. Um, <clears throat> interestingly, the, the top barrier for both friends and family was scheduling. And, and we know that that is an issue if anybody has tried to do an experiential gift. Next slide. So now on to my segmentation differences. So these were from some of the demographics. So for millennials, they're more likely to say that they would create an online wish list that they would share with family members, but they would not share that with a friend. Um, and you're gonna hear Casey talk about that a little bit more in a minute. They're more, more likely to say that they would be happier if they could buy more things. Now, I'm not gonna lie, this did break my heart a little bit. Um, I don't know the rationale, but I think perhaps that maybe they're not even meeting their physiological needs, being that the age that they are and the income that they're generating. Um, they probably still have school loans to pay off. And then they are less likely to carry a reusable bag. So I'm also going to hope that it's because maybe they just altogether don't use a bag at all. Maybe they're not picking a plastic or paper bag or a reusable bag. I don't know. But these were statistically different um, for millennials. Uh, for income level, not surprising. You know, if you have less income, you're less likely to travel. If you have more income, you're more likely to give this type of gift, less likely to wear thrift store clothes, and less likely to use cloth towels. Next uh, slide. So um, as a reminder, 77% of respondents were non-Hispanic white. So these are statistically significant results for the other 23% of respondents in aggregate. So non-whites are less likely to eat out, less likely to carry a refillable bottle or mug, and more likely to use cloth towels versus paper towels. They also differed in their belief of the top benefit to giving an experiential gift that you can see here. Um, and they differed in their top challenge to giving an experiential gift to family members. They felt that it was really hard to think of an age appropriate gift um, versus just this idea of scheduling being difficult. Next slide. So for the three indexes I created, there were some statistical differences. So those people that said that they were happier also said that they had less need for material things. So um, this is good. I'm not really sure which comes first. I'm not sure if you're happier, so then you say, hey, I need less things, or do you have less things which makes you happier? But this does follow all of the um, other national and global research around happiness, which is good. Those that do out-of-door activities were actually um, not that different than other responders, but on the flip side, if you don't do outdoor activities, you were also less likely to do anything. So I would just say that whether you were outdoor or indoor, it was more like if you don't do activities, period, it didn't really matter what type of activity. And then finally, the hypothesis was that if you were green-minded, you'd have a higher environmental ethos, 
and have statistically different responses. And that was true, but I'll, I'll, I'll point out here that 61% of the respondents were significantly different. So it's not as if 95% of those people that were green-minded were doing these activities. We still have room to kind of work with our choir or those that we might consider green-minded. Next slide. Okay, so just to kind of bring you back here, we've talked about the first thing, behavior. We've talked about the second thing, barriers and benefits. And now I'm gonna talk about um, strategy and pilot testing. So next slide. So um, for steps three and four on the next slide, um, I created an online pledge around experiential gift giving. And you heard Heather talk about the great plastics pledge that they're doing right now, which is awesome. So, you know, a, a very specific um, time-bound pledge is, is a good way to create a pledge. So after somebody did this pledge, they received three weekly emails between Thanksgiving and Christmas, and the emails addressed the barriers that we heard in the research. So the first one provided a summary of the research around consumption. The second one had a sample wish list, gift ideas, checklists. Um, and the third email had stories from others highlighting the normative component of an experiential gift. All right, next slide. So that was steps three and four. So now we're on step five, the evaluation. So in early January, I sent a post-pledge survey to the 241 pledge takers. And you can see here, we had a 29% response rate, and those 23 states on the map are represented in blue. So those were where people conducted the pre-pledge and post-pledge survey. So I'll just stipulate here if anybody's a stats major or does a lot of surveys, I did not have a control group. So there's only so much that I can say about this group, you know, and how the pledge impacted their behavior and their, uh, and their happiness. But I'm gonna share a little bit of results with you. Next slide. So the most common gift was a gift card. And I will stipulate here though that it had to be a gift card for an experience. This was not a gift card that was like an electronics or, or retail gift card. Um, next slide. Um, so here you can see that 83% followed through on their pledge and gave an experiential gift, which is great. And 59% of those gifts were given to family. So it was a little bit easier, I think, for people to give to family than it was to friends. And 42% of those experiential gifts was, were done within the two weeks of giving. So I think it is important, especially when you talk about the, ba the barrier of scheduling, to do that as quickly as you can um, to giving the gift. Uh, next slide. So according to post-pledge takers, 33% increased their satisfaction with life after the holidays, but 28% had their satisfaction with life go down. So again, I can't say that this was due to the pledge or giving an experiential gift. I think what this says to me is that the holidays are a very complex, somewhat stressful time for different folks. And so, um, you know, it, it could be a good or a bad time. 64% uh, said that they were somewhat satisfied to very satisfied with their life after the holidays. And this was up from 58% before the holidays for the same group of people. So that is good news. Next slide. Okay, so just in conclusion um, around this research, again, we did find that people are happier with less stuff. Um, I would implore you to just know that there are differences between these different audiences. So if you're doing social marketing or any kind of communications campaign and you can segment, please do. Um, and then, of course, even our green-minded and, you know, people that do a lot of the stuff that we ask them to do have room to improve. I would say that we definitely need to continue to brainstorm around this barrier of scheduling. You know, it is an issue. I do not live near my uh, family, and it, it, I have even personal stories around that. And then we definitely want to make sure that people think of inexpensive, inexpensive experiential gifts, that it does not necessarily have to be that Disney trip that you give somebody. And then finally, for this audience um, and, and the work and, and messaging that you do to your community, I would just ask you to kind of move beyond waste prevention from just the reusable bags and mugs to other things that people can do. All right, 
I think we had a, a little second here if there are any questions for me before we switch um, a little bit to Casey and her discussion around the uh, resources that New Dream has. If there's any questions for me. So, Kelly, yes, we do have a question. So, can you give an example of an experiential skip? <clears throat> yeah, I, I um, went through that slide rather quickly, but, um, you know, the idea was really to either spend time with friends or family. And the most common thing that we heard, and I, I didn't include this in the slides either, is holding a communal meal, whether you cook that or you go out, was the most common way that people spend time with um, friends and family during the holidays. So I think people always definitely welcome that as a gift. And um, we do really want to kind of help people think outside of the box for these, you know, more inexpensive ways. And if, if you're in a, a climate that allows you to get out during the holidays, you know, picnicking, camping, hiking, um, snowshoeing, skiing, you know, even if you're in the cold weather climate is always a really great way to increase your happiness and, and also um, give that, that uh, non-material gift. And so then I do have another question for you, Kelly. Um, your evaluation result for the life satisfaction is appears to be for life in total. Is that correct? Yes, it was. So if the, the happiness research, um, there is a standard set of questions that the happiness field uses. And um, I used four happiness questions and built an index around those four. But the main question that people use is, how satisfied are you with life today? Um, and, and then they rate it on a scale of zero to 10. So it's, it's really, we don't ask about happiness, we ask about life satisfaction. Um, but, but then, as I mentioned, it's, it's an index of four questions that kind of merge into happiness. But yeah, I hope that answered the question. And then I have another question, um, again, relating to the life satisfaction and the gift gifting. Um, did you ask any survey questions that were specific to the outcome of the gift, such as did the gift giving make you more or less happy than giving the thing? Yeah, I, I want to say, and I would have to go back and look at my um, detailed analysis, but hold on, let me go back to those slides. Um, I want to say that that status, I, that quote I gave statistic of 33% increased their satisfaction with life after the holidays, but 28% had their satisfaction with life go down. Um, I did not, no, come to think of it, I don't think I did that analysis to see of the 83% that actually followed through, right? So I don't know if I'm making sense here. So 83% of the people that pledged actually followed through by giving the experiential gift. I did not, I don't believe I broke that out by life satisfaction. I, I think I took all 100% of people's respondents um, and not just the 83% that completed the activity. But I would have to double check that. So there, it might be a little bit skewed because there were, you know, 17% of people that pledged but didn't take it, but may have actually answered the question about life satisfaction anyway. I did have some other um, like interesting points about that, that there were some people that said, you know, they increased their life satisfaction by two points after the, um, after the holidays, which is actually really, really high. So there were some outliers in the, in the happiness realm that definitely said they were happier after, after the holidays too. That was a good question though. Thank you. Okay. Great. Let's move on. Okay, it's, it's back to me. Um, I am going to take the next few minutes to go through and share with you some of the resources that are part of, of the Simplify the Holidays campaign, other resources that are designed to help folks escape the shopping, spending, frenzied preparations that be, have become synonymous <laughs> with our winter holidays. And, and I hope that, we hope that you can, that these free tools, tips, stories, guides, 
can be helpful to you and your community, we welcome you sharing them with your networks. You'll find a description of each of the resources, each of the resources I'm going to highlight in the handout that's provided for the webinar. So the handout also includes sample messages and graphics that you could easily incorporate into a newsletter or an email, blog post, a social media blurb, um, so, uh, and as well as links to direct links to the things I'll, I'll mention now. So next slide. The next slide shows uh, a resource, this first resource I'd like to, to mention to you is New Dream's free, uh, easy to use online uh, tool called the SoKind Registry. It provides the ability, like um, Kelly referenced, uh, to create a wish list of gifts of time, experience, handmade goods, charitable donations, or and or <laughs> useful items that you, you actually might need. So you, you can put some material. We, we realized that um, one way people might use the, the registry, the wish list is um, in preparing for a baby. And there actually sometimes are just a few essential things you need, like a place for the baby to sleep or a few things for them to wear. So it's, it, but it legitimizes, it, it encourages the giving also of those other types of gift categories as, as equally as significant and meaningful. Um, so with a wish list, you can request gifts that do align with your values, your lifestyle, but and, and reduce the clutter so you don't get more stuff than you need. And then you just you can distribute the wish list to your family and friends uh, to hopefully inspire them to give meaningful gifts in the same sort of way. Um, here's an example. This slide shows an example of the wish a holiday wish list. Uh, this snap screenshot doesn't show the full wish list, but I wanted to mention that it does include gift requests for a membership to a local museum, a music class, a CSA membership, uh, babysitting help, contributions to the kids' dress-up bin, gardening, sewing help, secondhand board games that are no longer in use for someone else, um, and donations to the local library. So I'd like to, I, I, I want to mention also here too that there is a study from Stanford that shows that gift recipients actually appreciate gifts that they explicitly request more than those that they do not. Um, so there is a value, um, quantifiable value on those, on using a wish list. The next slide shows an example of another feature of the SoKind registry. It's called a give list. So with a give list, what you can do is turn a traditional registry kind of on its head and offer the gifts that you would like to give to your loved ones, friends, coworkers. Um, if there's a local artist you want to support, you could put one of her pieces on the give list or organizations that you want to help. Um, you could also offer a set amount that you're happy to donate to a charity of a recipient's choosing. But you can also offer your skills, um, uh, your, your time to support family and friends. Uh, some, a few quick examples are if, if your son likes to walk dogs but doesn't have his own dog, or your daughter wants to teach, would be up for teaching a younger friend how to play a song on the recorder, um, if you're good with a camera, you can offer to take family portraits of, of other people that you care about. Uh, that's always popular. But you can list ideas like this and then let your loved one, your community, do the choosing so that, so that these outside of the box gift ideas, they end up with the right people. And you, meanwhile, can also create fun new memories um, with, with folks you care about. So next slide. The holiday, Simplify the Holidays Guide, this is just our, our umbrella popular like sort of planning resource that includes practical tips uh, to help folks create meaningful holidays that are focused on sharing, laughter, creativity, and personal renewal. Uh, this image is, shows a page from the guide that helps users to identify aspects of holiday celebrations that feel most important and meaningful. So, helps you in making a strategy to preserve the host qualities of your holidays. 
you can, I, I want to mention too, you can download this guide free from the New Dream website as well as, as, as the other resources, I, any of the resources I mentioned now and today. The next slide um, will feature, shows the Simplify the Holidays calendar. This is an online six-week calendar that offers interactive quizzes, practical tips, real stories, and personal inspiration to help plan, plan for the holidays, plan for more joy, less stuff. Um, this shows the calendar. Each week has a different theme, like budgeting, entertaining, reducing waste, creating more meaning. And then each day has a different activity, like a tip or a story example or an exercise. Um, so you can use this to help count down to the holidays. The next slide shows our more fun, less stuff gift catalog. So there, there was a question about examples, um, looking for more examples on experiential gift ideas. And there are you know, hundreds of alternative gift ideas, set, many of them experiential in this resource. Um, so ideas to help strengthen relationships without breaking the bank as well. This, this sample page features uh, gift ideas that might be particularly suitable for parents or grandparents. Next slide shows um, the N New Dreams coupon book. And you can use this coupon book to deliver several of the ideas listed in the More Fun, Less Stuff gift catalog. Uh, you can give gifts of time, experience, memories using this template that you can print out, customize, and, and distribute to folks of all ages. Um, there's also a few more examples here listed, uh, gift ideas listed from the, the catalog. So next, next slide uh, features, there, New Dream has resources also focused specifically on families and, and children. Um, this family celebration guide is full of tips for hosting all sorts of celebrations and community events. Um, that focus on meaning and connection. It in specifically includes a section on holiday celebrations, but, but also covers things like baby showers and birthday parties and, and potlucks. So uh, backyard barbecues, times when um, you, you, you might feel a, a pressure to consume a lot and, and buy a lot of things in order to produce this amazing event, but is not at all um, true. And so that's where this guide is. It helps to expose some of those ideas and hacks and tips. The next slide shows um, the Simplify the Holidays video. It's a very short, easy to share video that gives a great overview of how and why to simplify the holidays. And this video, sharing this video is a great way to bring family and friends along with how you would like to celebrate the holidays, encouraging them to join in. Um, I, I am one of, of many people I know that is, you know, has worked hard to try to shift the culture within my, my own family. And, and this is a helpful resource that I've used as well as, as the so kind tools as well. And the next slide shows that, um, features some ideas that, you know, despite our best efforts, many of us fall into that last minute panic as the holidays get, get near of running out to buy just one more stocking stuffer. So New Dream created a listing of last minute gift ideas. Some of the ideas included in that resource are shown here, including like a subscription to a homemade, a, a monthly homemade dessert for three months or however long you want to define the subscription, um, a coupon for, for sleeping in on the weekend, um, a coupon for a night of indoor camping with scary stories and some mores. And then possibly offering yourself up as an exercise accountability partner. The next slide shows the resource we just created this year for this, the campaign this year. And it's a, a community presentation, a prepackaged slideshow that walks presenters through making the case for more meaningful holidays. It highlights the hurdles and solutions for simplifying. The presentation is intended to help facilitate a conversation with a local or regional group that you are involved in, such as, such as a, the department, a department at work, um, a community that you serve, a church or a PTO group, 
or simply your inner circle or for ins your own personal self inspiration. Um, this is downloadable from, from our website. And then finally, <laughs> we have updated the Simplify the Holiday Pledge this year to be a little more general than what Kelly did designed for the last year and for her research project. But this year, it's simply um, a long list of options that folks can adopt to do to celebrate the holidays with more of what matters. And folks can select at least three actions from that long list of, of what they're going to commit to, to doing for this year. So um, the next slide, my last slide, before I pass back to Kelly, I just wanted to mention the three other campaigns that tie into, new dream campaigns that tie into waste reduction. Uh, our Kids in Commercialism program <clears throat> provides resources, uh, tips for creating non-commercial environments and experiment, experiences for kids. <clears throat> our Community and Action Challenge is a series of challenges that help you that you can take to strengthen your communities, reduce waste, um, better love your neighbors. And our, our latest question consumption campaign is a collaboration of public art and inquiry to challenge the idea that our worth and our happiness are represented by what we buy. So um, you can find out more about those from the New Dream website, but uh, I wanna quickly pass back to Kelly to, to make sure we have time for the last piece um, her last piece here. Thank you. Thank you, Casey. So um, I am not going to talk about all these things on this slide here, but I do wanted, I just wanted to come back to some of those, you know, three to four main points I made at the beginning, right? Take this opportunity to change the narrative. Use some of these new dream resources. Try to equally mention waste prevention when you talk about recycling. I don't know this answer to metrics, but there are people that are uh, really smart working on this that you can see here um, out of Oregon, Retrack, Certic, and, and the Urban Sustainability Network. Um, and then really try to tie this to health whenever you can. I, I don't know if it works, but I'd love to see my colleagues trying it to say to me, oh yeah, this worked or that didn't, or you know, just even giving me some anecdotal um, thoughts around who, who you might be working with on the, on the health side of things. And then my, my last slide here, um, I promised that I would come back to talk about this social ecological model, right? So New Dream um, and the work that I talked about really focuses on this individual, but I'm sure many of you are already doing some of this work in your community that maybe ties to some of these other um, components within the model, right? the interpersonal idea of, you know, changing the way um, you just pack a child's lunch to be more low waste or promoting the app like Nextdoor as a way to, you know, share things within a community. And then maybe at the organizational level, you know, are you helping to promote lending libraries of all kinds, not just books, um, working with various organizations on waste prevention? And then maybe as it goes towards the community level, I like to say that, you know, if the infrastructure doesn't exist for various things that we want, it's a great way to go talk to your local chamber of commerce and talk about market development. If people want to rent and, you know, rent products or do more thrifting and you don't really have a robust um, market for that in your community, you really have the opportunity to, to help build that infrastructure. And then I know, you know, nobody really likes to talk about public policy, but there are some public policy options that could allow you to get to waste prevention. And um, these may not be suitable for your community, but it does fit within this uh, model of ultimate behavior change um, around waste prevention. So staying on this slide here, I just want to say that for me, one example that I would use where this social ecological model comes into play is, you know, I would really like to be able to buy more bulk goods, meaning I bring my actual container in and then I, um, you know, pour, pour it out into my own container. But my community does not have a lot of bulk options for me. So you can see how this might be where I would need to work at the organizational or community level even if I have a lot of knowledge and motivation around that activity as an individual. So again, I'm not naive. I know that it's not easy to talk about waste prevention and it can take more time and work, but I do um, 
ask all of you to, to work upstream and downstream to, to try to make progress, and I would love to work with you and partner with you on that. Um, and I'll just say, if you're interested in this social and behavior change work, I'm, I'm a volunteer for another organization called the Social Marketing Association of North America. So if you want to learn more about these models and these behavior change strategies, you might want to look up SMANA.org. But I think we have a few minutes left for questions, Heather. I know we got started a little late there. Yeah, and I do have a question that's kind of related just to a comment that you just made, and that is in referencing that your um, project, your thesis was done off of a social media. In which social media platforms did you use? Um, yeah, that's a common misconception. I don't do social media. I do social marketing. So it's the use of commercial marketing for societal good. So we may use digital components like Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube, but it, it was um, not necessarily a channel I used. We, we used email for our intervention, but um, a lot of social marketing campaigns don't necessarily use um, social media. It's a common confusion among the terms. <laughs> All right. Sorry so to disappoint you, everyone, to know about Facebook. <laughs> No, that's okay. I want to thank Kelly and Casey, both of you, for taking the time and participating in our webinar today. Um, if anyone has any questions, I can research the slide here. Um, here's the contact information for both Kelly and Casey, um, along with the new Dream website. Um, I don't have any other questions at this time, so I will end the webinar. Hmm. Thanks, thank everyone. You, yeah, thank, thank you, Heather. You. Wishing everyone a great Thanksgiving season with with more joy, less stuff. <laughs> Bye. Bye.